Welcome to the Queer Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Venagoni. Here we have conversations with artists, healers, and activists who enliven the LGBTQ communities and who empower our queer spirits to flourish. My guest today is Anna Renee Wingett. Anna is an artist, activist, scholar, and educator. They currently serve as affiliated scholar at the University of California Humanities Research Institute, where they are collaborating on Crossing Pride, a transnational digital healing storytelling project and archive by, for, with queer and trans refugees. Anna teaches theater and writing in communities and universities and develops new collaborative performances with communities towards decolonizing and healing. They have developed the Newcomers Project, which focuses on empowerment for queer and trans refugees. Today we hear how Anna found a place in theater to express and find their true identity. Anna shares how they explored the therapeutic and social justice aspects of theater and eventually traveled internationally, helping queer refugees tell their own stories. Find them online at AnnaWingit.com. That's A-N-N-A-W-I-N-G-E-T dot com. Hi, Anna. Welcome to The Queer Spirit. Hi. Thank you for having me. It's exciting to be here. I've been admiring your podcast for a while. Oh, thank you. So before we start talking about some of the projects you're currently working on, which are seem to me a lot of them are related to using theater and performance work as healing and activism, I thought we would start by just hearing a little bit from you about how you first got interested in theater and performance work. Sure. Yeah, thank you. I was a queer little Mormon kid growing up in California and feeling really out of place and like you know, no one understood me. I didn't belong anywhere. And I think I found theater as a child as this exciting way to explore parts of myself that, you know, were either forbidden by (laughs) Mormonism, like exploring with gender, exploring like I was really, from the time I was five, I was really inspired by Bette Midler because she was like everything a Mormon kid was not supposed to be. And I was like in that hair and that like brassy, ballsy attitude, you know, I was like, wow, like women can behave that way. She was the wind beneath your wings. (laughs) (laughs) 100%. Yes. So I just started performing. I loved, um, it was this freedom that nothing else really gave me. Maybe writing became another kind of outlet for me that I know I didn't really think of it in healing terms. Although already in high school, I had like, I had attempted suicide and just grappling with, you know, like, like very deep, dark depression with, you know, coming to terms with being someone who had a strong faith, like loved God, loved Jesus, and was, you know, very, very queer. <laughs> so I really struggled with that. And somehow, you know, I think the only time I really felt myself was when I was doing theater. And I actually did a project in high school that was about how theater and film can be a tool for education and for like consciousness raising and that. So I was already starting to think about that as a teen. And then that became obviously more and more important in later work. And like the first project that I did that really brought together kind of healing and social justice and performance was when I was at Loyola Marymount University as a student. And this was like maybe 2005. And the Tongva people were protesting outside of the university that's on a bluff. And there were developers that were very carelessly removing bones from a sacred burial on that bluff. And because the Tongva did not have national tribe status, their rights were very limited. And, but they were out there every day for, I don't know, months, like protesting. Some other people were joining them, but you could not drive onto campus without seeing protesters and without seeing like buckets 
outside under these tents of like this kind of excavation that was happening without consent of the Tongva people. So anyway, I was taking a class and some students and I interviewed some of the Tongva people, interviewed developers, interviewed students and people involved in the project. And we tried to like create a dialogue on campus of like what was going on, what the concerns were. And that was a really like satisfying project. I mean, it was very heartbreaking and it was like, you know, the, unfortunately this is a very common story and, you know, and uh, it was my first project. So there's a lot I would do different now, but it was, uh, it kind of started me on a, a track, I think of bringing these elements together, social justice, healing and performance. Can you share with us a little bit about what that project looked like? So, I mean, it was very interdisciplinary. We had uh, some visual elements that were projected. There were uh, actors, so it wasn't the people who we interviewed who were on stage, but we shared before we did have it performed, we shared the scripts with everyone who was involved and kind of gave them a chance to revise things so that text came from kind of Anna DeVere Smith style where we record verbatim and then take out some, you know, like a chunk of their interview and then put it in the script. But, and then we, but of course we curated and structured it and we created a a scene with where everyone had a chance to like, I think there was some kind of like talking stick or something. And it was like a series of monologues. So it wasn't you weren't really getting the interaction between people, but it was like just everyone kind of had a chance to share their story and how this project was affecting them. I think it was a one act. And then we would have like a post-show discussion with the audience. And, you know, the goal was also to kind of educate about what was going on with the project and, and just to get like a full scope of how this was impacting different members of the community and particularly the Tongva people. And of course, what came out was like how powerless they felt in this situation. And there was a lot of anger and frustration and, you know, and how this has happened again and again, of course. Yeah, I I mean, I think it, at least we were able to have some honest dialogue and to hear from the Tongva people on campus, like, through the script, like through the actors who played their parts, you know, because otherwise they were just protesters that like you were passing on the way to school. So this was kind of really getting a chance to hear their story and, and what was going on and why they thought it was important to be out there every day. I wonder if we can rewind a little bit because you skimmed over a little bit of your experience, particularly when you were in high school. And I'm wondering you know, if you can share a little bit more about your experience of maybe using theater yourself as possibly a way to explore your own identity feeling. I imagine that, you know, when you're acting, you get to be whoever you want to be or whoever the character is. And I wonder if that was a way for you to really experience like, oh, this is how I can like explore not being the person that maybe my religious community is telling me I should be, but the person that I want to be by being, but putting a mask on and saying, well, this isn't me, you know, so it's okay, you know, and eventually at the end of the day, I'll take my mask off and come back to the church and be this person that you want me to be. Right. Yeah. I I mean, it's as you described, I think I was very concerned with being, you know, being a good girl at that time, I identify as non-binary, but at that time being a good girl and, you know, so it did allow me an opportunity to like, I mean, whether it's playing a role of like someone who swore and had a like loud, filthy mouth or (laughs) whether it was like exaggerating gender. I got cast as like a lot of like maternal roles, which, (laughs) but I would just, I don't know, I would bring a little Bette Midler quality and I love, you know, embodying more masculinity. And I think this is the embodiment part is something that I just find so powerful and healing work is like, I'm studying to be a drama therapist and to step into a role and to 
actually, you know, feel it in your bones kind of and move as this role or, you know, it can be very empowering. Like, in, and I know there's studies where they, you know, can look at like how the brain changes or people feeling more confident just by like shifting physically into a more having better posture and like having lifting your chin up and like, you know, standing with this powerful pose, like that, that actually changes the way that you feel and you feel more powerful. And so, you know, just playing around with like, what does power feel like when I feel so powerless? Because I also experienced a lot of trauma as a, as a young child. So what is it, you know, to play a character who is fearless, who is powerful, is just it accesses a part of myself that I haven't learned to access in everyday life. But it also tells me that it's there, that it exists within me, and I can access it off the stage. So I think that was a really freeing discovery. And people used to tell me like, they'd see me on stage, and they'd be like, I had like, you're so quiet, like I had no idea that was in you. (laughs) You know, it was me kind of unleashing everything that I was bottling up when I was like trying to be the obedient, good kid. So that had a huge impact on me. And I really, between, I say that it was like theater and my faith, like that saved my life. Although my faith also almost killed me. Like the religion almost killed me. My faith saved me because I had a place that I felt safe in my theater class where there were like other queer people but anyway it showed me possibilities and something I've been really interested in my academic work too is like and well in fact my dissertation is called performing possibilities and this is very much in the vein of Augusto Boal and theater of the oppressed and Jose Munoz talks about you queer utopia and Jill Dolan writes about utopian performance. It's very, it's not like a new concept, but just the idea that we, if we can embody and try and perform something that is not yet present or that has not yet come into existence, like we can bring it into existence. We can access and as if, and that will help us, you know, embody that. And like Augusta, the wall calls it like rehearsing for the revolution and you know similarly like with drama therapy you can perform like as if I had power in this moment like I've personally done a kind of therapeutic work where I've like relived a sexual trauma and like performed myself as an empowered you know as if I had power as if I could embody power, you know, respond in a different way. And it was incredibly transformative. I want to take a quick break to offer you a gift. I work with many queer folks who struggle with self-esteem, self-acceptance, and confidence. And I get it. Growing up queer is no cakewalk. Living in a world filled with homophobia and oppression can take its toll. Having the strength to be your true self can be a challenge. But you can change that. So if you'd like support taking the first few steps, head over to my website and grab the free mini course, The Self-Confident Queer. Just go to queerhealingjourneys.com forward slash confident. This mini course will walk you through three simple steps to help you begin to build your self-worth and confidence today. So head over to queerhealingjourneys.com forward slash confident and get the free course today. Okay, now back to the conversation. Yeah, I've done a few different kind of drama therapy exercises and groups and stuff like that. And it's really cool to be able to like redo something, but do it differently than maybe you got to do or was were able to do. And to sort of feel that not just like and imagine it, but to actually live it and perform it out or act it out and have feel it in your body and to go oh this is what it felt like if I were able to say this or I was able to do this or I wasn't injured or you know could defend myself or had someone else there to support me or protect me yeah so you also do have done a lot of work with refugees and migrants both 
here in the US and abroad. And I'm curious how you first got started with that work. I mean, I can see how, you know, maybe the work that happened in college with the Tongva people may have been like, oh, I'm thinking about other people and other cultures, even though, you know, they're not migrants and they're not refugees. Well, I guess maybe they could be a kind of refugee. But, you know, how did that first get started for you? Yeah. So I, after that work with the Tongva people, I went on, well, I had a short <laughs> period as a, as a monastic, but then I went to graduate school and I did work with, I was getting my MFA in playwriting at Boston University. And I was like working for, well, first I worked with incarcerated youth in San Francisco through an organization. I think they still exist called Each One Reach One. And they put on, they do playwriting with the incarcerated young men and women and then put on performances. That was the kind of the next transformative experience I had where I was like, but then it was the people I was working with were a part of the entire process, like not just the script writing, but the performance and the, and just seeing the transformation and the sense of like pride and accomplishment was really powerful. So I got really passionate about continuing that work, but there was no at that point, no self-reflection into like that it could be problematic that me as like a white person of like certain privilege would come into these spaces and quote unquote help by creating a piece of theater. And so, you know, I just, I didn't have that vocabulary, I didn't have that awareness. And I would I continued kind of working with un, like underserved communities, or we would say like underrepresented groups. Uh, like queer kids in rural areas. I did work in Austin, Texas with Creative Action uh, was an organization. And this Youth Underground was another one in Boston that Anna DeVere Smith had started. So I got more training in kind of her method, which, you know, is, as I said before, like honoring the word of the people. Her whole thing is like people speak in poetry and everyday language and like there's this real reverence for the vernacular and the and the words that people use in daily life and so we use that method and then I kind of started I worked with some groups that used more theater of the oppressed so anyway there were all these different organizations and groups kind of doing this work of like we're you know serving members of the community that of, you know, this like an urban community or rural community that maybe wouldn't have access to theater. And it would be, you know, I would like predominantly white people like organizing these things. So as I started to learn more, especially in my PhD about, you know, like how to decenter whiteness and how the kind of the way that systems of oppression work. So the fact that, that like these communities are in need of help is like kind of just framing them that way is like a disempowering way of looking at the communities. But and then also just working with nonprofits that kind of fill gaps that, you know, should be filled in other ways, like society, like it's just putting band-aids on like huge social problems. So all that to say, I still, you know, it's like, how do you change society? Like all you get, I mean, what, what you can do is I've done a lot of work, a lot of research on empowerment, like how to step back and, you know, like open like I can help open spaces and I can help facilitate spaces for folks who are un underprivileged, but I also need to kind of acknowledge and own up to like my level of privilege in the room and that that's always going to be present. And my whiteness is always going to be with me, no matter how, like how much I step back and, you know, so there's sometimes I just need to step out of the room completely because like my whiteness just doesn't need to be in the space, you know? So I've had to learn this, but so I say that I preface the refugee work with that because even with all the research and all the work with trauma and with these different groups, I was very naive and unprepared for like what I 
would face with working with LGBT refugees. I had moved to Sweden for a girl, as one does, but I'm also, I have a family lineage on my mother's side that's Swedish. So anyway, my ex is a lawyer and was volunteering with LGBT refugees in Stockholm. And I actually saw, I got to meet some of these people through her. And there was an exhibit called Playground at the Ethnography Museum in Stockholm that showed objects of refugees who were LGBT. And there was like a typed up story. And I was like, this is really powerful. And it would be more powerful with performance. And then, you know, and instead of like putting things on display, you know, like thinking about how the process of sharing and like being creative could be a healing modality for the people who participate. So I kind of, that sort of started, that must've been like 2016 or something. And then, and then I was like, well, I hadn't even known about this, that there was an LGBT refugee crisis. I didn't know that like 70 countries around the world criminalize same sex intimacy. And, you know, we, there's just so little coverage, so little representation. So, you know, I mean, I think we know that there's homophobia worldwide, but we, we celebrate world pride, like in New York, as though other countries like were all like there weren't so many countries who were unable to celebrate pride, you know, so I think there's a, a huge blindness in the LGBT community in the U.S. and in the global north to like just how many people are suffering just on on the basis of being on queer or trans. So I just started volunteering with an organization called Newcomers that was part of the National LGBT Rights Organization in Sweden. And, you know, and I was doing things with like helping with organizational stuff, you know, whatever was needed. But I started talking to people uh, about the kind of work that I do and like just asking if there might be any interest. Do people like want to share their stories? Are they, just, are they scared about that? You know, and there was a lot of people, a lot of migrants who were seeking asylum in Stockholm on, on the basis of being LGBT, who really felt, you know, voiceless and just wanted to be able to share their story and wanted to be heard, wanted to get their story out, and for people in Sweden to know what it's like for them, what it's like for the people that are still in their home countries. And so, you know, together, like people who are really interested in that, like we started the Newcomers Performance Project. And it was like um, every, it started every few weeks, but then it became a weekly thing. But anyway, we were asked to put on a play as part of Stockholm Pride. So when I say naive, like I've been through trauma, I've heard a lot of, you know, in my time working with storytelling and and performance and with these different groups, I've heard a lot of traumatic stories. I've worked with someone who, you know, had to kill someone in self-defense, you know, like people who had survived suicide attempts. Anyway, I've never heard stories like this kind of complex trauma. Every story that I heard was the most horrific, violent, heartbreaking story that I'd ever heard, like one right after another. And I found myself like, I don't have the training for that. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a social worker. And I think this happens like to a lot of well-meaning people who like, you know, especially in well, in, at least in theater, like in the arts, kind of coming into these communities. So that was something I did have support trauma psychologists that was kind of helping me through the process, but not at first. That was later on when I realized I needed that. So, I mean, there was that, there was how that impacted me, but also I realized that it's not going to help them to like go out and trauma dump on stage. You know, this is not what healing looks like. And I kind of talked uh, through things with the psychologist and I like did my own research. And anyway, what we started working with was like more and more distancing tools, 
So telling your story through like an animal or an object or through myth and fantasy. So like where I had used interview style in the past, it's just like it wasn't appropriate at least at that time. I mean, the majority of the group members had just barely arrived, you know, in sweet, like just having been through the worst experiences of their lives. And I think it's great to really share like the whole journey that you've been on through your experience, but also sharing how your journey has supported other people's experience. And, you know, I think that's kind of one of the themes here is like, storytelling and do our how our stories support other people's stories and i think that's really i mean from my perspective like the big piece of work that you're doing is you're creating space for people to share their stories safely to reauthor their stories and to retell their stories in a way that feels healing and empowering and then to share those stories too, to allow their voices to be heard by other people who don't know, like you were sharing, like hearing some really intense stories of people. And I think that that's, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that's like one of the biggest, most transformational aspects of this work. Yeah, I think it, the community building is a huge part because as we did, you know, as we worked more with as a group, like trust building exercises and like and group-based kind of creative exercises, you know, over time with the kind of sharing of stories and seeing and hearing other people who have a similar story as you, or there's, you know, some kind of resonance to the story, they started to call the group their family, you know, I mean, they didn't have their most, for most of them, their families had rejected them because of their sexuality or their gender so they kind of that and that was the most beautiful thing to witness was like to watch that even without an audience like we did present in front of audiences but that wasn't what the real healing that I saw was like happening in the rehearsal room like in the space those like weekly workshops where we you know were trying out different exercises on you know where people were like embodying a mythological character and and that but like sharing something of how they were feeling and then feeling seen and heard and like having a safe space with people who shared there was you know there's this shared experience that's so unique and so special and I think particularly because there was so much shame around who for not everyone I don't want to generalize but like so much shame around who they were like and their journey and like that like to find other people and who were like it allowed for a space for like celebration of who they are and in community and I think that with like working creatively together on a project and like with people who have that shared experience was really transformative yeah So you've already shared a lot of different experiences and processes you've gone through. But as we wrap up here, can you share with us a particular person, practice or experience that has supported your queer spirit to flourish? I think the most important for me has been radical acceptance and radical compassion. Like from being raised Mormon and a little bit about what I was sharing, there was a lot of internalized shame that who I was was like wrong also because of the trauma history like believing some sense of like that I deserve this and I was meditating I was like doing all the healing things but I like it wasn't until I really could practice radical acceptance and like whatever comes up every part of myself is okay is belongs the parts that I've hated about myself they belong And I can hold compassion for all of them, all these parts of myself and really being able to allow space to hold that is what is helping me to be a better healer. Or I like to say someone who facilitates, helps to facilitate healing. That's been the most important for me at this time. Beautiful. Thank you. 
So Anna, can you share with people where they can find you and connect with you and hear more about your your work and your projects? Yes, you can find me on Instagram at uh, two the number two queer and heal, and you can find me on AnnaWinget.com. And there's contact information there too. You can email me, and I love to hear from anyone who's interested in healing and performance and queerness. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I'll have those links in the show notes. But thank you again for being here and sharing your story with us to uh, help other people share theirs and find healing through their stories. Thank you so much for having me. To find the resources we discussed today, find the show notes at thequeerspirit.com. Make sure you don't miss future episodes by following the show on Apple Podcasts or subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for listening. Until next time, be well.